Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 20th meeting in 2017 of the France and Constitution Committee. Can I just remind members as normal to switch off your phones or at least put them in a mode that won't interfere with proceedings. Um, as this is the first public meeting of the committee that Alexander Burnett has attended, our first item is a declaration of interest from Alexander and I welcome him very warmly to the committee and invite him to declare any relevant interests. Uh, thank you, convener. And can I take this opportunity to refer members to my register of interest? Uh, specifically, I declare an interest as an owner and manager of property, including agricultural, residential and commercial lettings, recreational and sporting usage and forestry, as a shareholder in a renewable energy company, and as the holder of remunerated positions in companies related to these matters. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Um, the second item on agenda is to decide whether to take item five and any future discussion on the work programme on private. Are members agreed? Yes. Mm. Members are agreed. The third item on our agenda is to take evidence this morning in relation to the Scottish Fiscals Commission forecast evaluation report 2017. And we're joined for this item by Lady Susan Rice, the chair of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, Professor Alistair Smith, who's one of the commissioners, David Wilson, who's also one of the commissioners, and John Ireland, the chief executive. A warm welcome to the meeting this morning, and I invite Lady Rice to make a, a short opening statement. Uh, good morning, convener and, uh, and the committee, and thank you. In fact, I probably should thank you three times over, first of all, for inviting us to give evidence today, um, uh, for also for engaging with us at various times earlier in the year, especially when the OECD was over and had their conference, which was held here in the Parliament. And in preparing for this session, it suddenly dawned on me that we hadn't officially and formally been in front of this committee since the end of last year. So I wanted to thank you for the reprieve. Um, but, but, but uh, but could I uh, say that um, it didn't, doesn't really make a difference because you are always on our minds. Um, and I gather this is your first session um, after the recess uh, and we're your first public, uh, public um, uh, uh, conversation. But this is also our first appearance as a statutory body of the Fiscal Commission. And um, I'm joined by the first time for my by my colleagues whom you've just uh, you've just named um, as you know on april 1st another first this year we assumed responsibility for independently forecasting scottish gdp devolved tax receipts and devolved demand-led social security expenditure the transition from a non-statutory body scrutinizing the scottish government's forecasts to becoming an independent non-ministerial department has been a fair piece of work um, and we'll leave it at that um, but i think you'll want to know that we've agreed a formal protocol call with the Scottish Government, which is set out in a framework document, and we've made similar or are in the process of finalising similar arrangements with the OBR, HMRC, Revenue Scotland and other bodies. Since April, in addition to induction for my colleagues here, and I joined those sessions as well because I think it never hurts to be reminded, uh, we've also recruited 15 or so analytical staff, and they come from both the Scottish and UK civil service, from academia, from the private sector, so quite varying backgrounds. Their experience includes fiscal forecasting, macroeconomic modeling, housing market analysis, and public sector finances. And they are a good team. We're very pleased, and we've been getting down to work proper. We published our draft corporate plan yesterday, which you may have seen, or possibly not. We hope you will. Uh, and last week, of course, we produced our first publications, the forecast evaluation report, which we're here to discuss with you today. This is for 1617, and a paper setting out how we propose to approach our forecasts at the time of the draft budget later this year. We also have kicked off a program of external engagement because it's important that the people who care about what we do know us. That includes yourselves, and we were pleased that a number of you were able to attend the session we held for parliamentarians in June. Over the summer, we also had some experts, forecasting experts from around the UK, engage with our teams, going over the forecasts, turning them inside out, commenting on our work that we're doing right now, but also for the future. We'll be meeting informally with a number of other economists next month to take them through our approaches and our ideas. And as with the journalists we met earlier in the year, we want to keep our stakeholders as well informed as we can, be in part because it's the right thing to do, in part because that reflects our adherence to the OECD principles for independent fiscal institutions, um, IFIs, uh, which is what we are. 
And that brings us full circle to this evidence session, which, uh, in which we'll be happy to answer questions about our forecast evaluation report. I'm sure you want to get into the details, so let me just leave you with a couple of what I call keepers, just a couple of high-level thoughts. The first is that forecasting is challenging, but it's also an inexact science. And at any point in time, there can be a range of valid and reasonable forecasts that could be made. Uh, there's no one right forecast that you pull out of the pot. Forecasting, therefore, typically involves judgment, and judgments change over time. As a committee, I know you've been grappling with the changing relationship between the UK and the EU, wearing your other hats. Um, this also is an example where the Commission will have to make broad judgments about the flight path, if you will, in order to produce our forecast, and that'll come later in the, in the autumn. Uh, the second keeper, the second thought, is that forecasts benefit uh, increasingly as data accumulate. Um, you can see from the report how the approaches to our devolved taxes developed between 2015 and 16. We expect as we get more data over time under the new taxes, especially under a newly structured tax such as LBTT, that the models will be further enhanced and developed. Um, I mean, one example, additional dwelling supplement ADS was very challenging to forecast in the first instance because there were no data to start with. So there was an approximation of uh, the best approximation of what might be the baseline numbers. We now have a first full year of data of how many properties uh, fell under that category. And over time, uh, we'll have more. So that will in improve. So for us, the insights from this evaluation report have been really helpful as we develop our models um, for the forecasting that we'll be doing later this year. We hope you found it helpful as well, and we're happy now to try to answer your questions. And thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Lady Rice. I, I remember that the whole issue of forecasting became clear in my mind, if forecasting had ever been clear in anyone's mind, when Robert Choate said it was a bit like spot the ball but somebody's always moving the ball on the spot the ball picture, for those of you who are old enough to remember spot the ball. <laughs> um, so on that note, um, your executive summary at paragraph four on LBTT states, residential forecasts is sensitive to changes in house prices and volume of purchases brings with it overall forecast errors. But I'm not sure that fully explains the forecast changes between December 15 and December 16 in Table 1. It would be helpful, therefore, if you could explain to the committee the main reason why the Scottish Government forecast, if you can, for residential LBTT for 2016-17 was 282 million in December 15 and then 181 million in December 16, as indicated, as I said, in that Table 1 in your executive summary. Just so I can more fully understand it, it would be helpful. Um, well, if I, if I can uh, have a go at that, the main difference uh, between the two Scottish Government forecasts uh, is the basis on which uh, they forecast house prices. And the, uh, in the earlier forecast period, uh, as I think it says somewhere in the report, uh, the, the Government forecasts uh, were uh, looking at a, a rather long period of experience with house prices, including house prices before the global financial crisis of 2008, and expecting that the economy and the housing market was going to revert to historical patterns in due course. Um, and But by 2015, I think we all understood that the effects of the global financial crisis on the housing market and elsewhere were pretty long-lasting and that it was no longer reasonable to suppose that the housing market was going to go back to its pre-2008 period. So there, there's quite a substantial change in view of what data about the housing market was relevant for the forecast. And that's, that's the big change that took place between the two government forecasts, that uh, in the later forecast, no, atten no attention was given to prices before 2008, because that was regarded rightly, in our view, as ancient history by that point. Okay, that sets the scene. Um, uh, Ash, I think you used some questions around LBTT as well, so we'll just stick on the LBT issue at the moment, folks. Yes, um, I think some of my questions have been partially covered by that answer, but I'm just wondering, can I get a bit of clarity on the log normal distribution model? 
because in your report, it, it suggests that the model did fit the data, but then it goes on to say that the forecast error in the top two tax brackets, that's the highest two, um, was partially due to the fit of the log normal distribution. Could you explain that for me a little? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll try. There, there's, nothing, there's nothing magic about the log normal distribution. It's just a mathematical way of describing certain kinds of distributions of which house prices is, 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 is one, or indeed house, house transactions is one. Um, and it happens to work pretty well in the, house, the Scottish housing market as in other housing markets, except at the very top of the distribution. So it isn't that there's something extraordinary happening up there. It's just it happens to be that this little piece of mathematical kit doesn't fit so well up at the top, and it's necessary to, to make an adjustment. And the adjustment that was needed was sl slightly larger in the second period than in the first period. Uh, but it's, it's, it's just a statistical way of, of describing uh, the numbers, which proves to be very, very useful. And it, making the adjustment makes it more accurate. It's not perfectly accurate, but it's a very good working tool that helps the forecasters make their forecasts. So as a tool, this would be the tool that you would use to make these forecasts. You've got no plans to, to move to. Is there anything better out there, or is this kind of the best practice? Our current plans are to uh, that the, the, log, the adjusted log normal will still play a central role in the forecast. But uh, we're looking to develop, uh, to develop the tools further. For example, and maybe this is something we come to by looking in greater depth at behavioural effects. Right. But the, the, the log normal approach we envisage will still play a central role. OK, thank you. Alexander, I think you had a question about LBTT and particularly in the North East. Do you want to yeah, deal with that yeah. now? Uh, thank you. Um, as you say, well, you know, one of the components of the errors is the number of property transactions. And uh, I think the error accounted for 6 million uh, last year, which is a 23 million swing on the, on the errors for the previous year. Um, I was wondering how, what uh, breakdown of figures of a number of transactions there were for geographical regions uh, and whether those were in line with forecast across across Scotland uh, and specifically, if I'm understanding the figures the report right, uh, in 234 are you saying, uh, talking about the North East and the Aberdeen housing market, are you saying it was in line uh, with forecast? And if so, I wonder if where that. So let me give you the, the first part of the answer and turn to one of my colleagues to, to, to follow up. Um, last year, uh, in our previous guise as a commission, in um, having uh, challenge meetings with the Scottish government forecasters, um, we saw variation in the numbers that were, were coming. This is all work in progress, probably um, summer of 2016. And we speculated. Maybe there's an impact because of um, the economic uh, uh, constraints that were happening in the Northeast and suggested that um, that be looked at specifically. Um, we don't do regional analysis or sort of 32 local authorities or anything of that sort, but we felt that that was a, a significant area to um, explore. Uh, and that's why um, that was teased out. Uh, but actually what we found was that um, house price growth was you know, there were not noticeable impacts uh, from the uh, what happened in the northeast, at least at this point in time. Um, any further well, comments? Uh, uh, paragraph uh, 234 and 235 uh, in, in the report said out what, what we did. Uh, and it is the case that house prices in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire uh, have had lower growth than in the rest of Scotland. And um, it, in, the, in figure 2.8, uh, it shows the effects, figure 2.8 shows the effects in 2015 and 2016 forecasts of Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire having been different. The way it does it is, uh, had Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire followed the Scottish average, there would have been this much more uh, LBTT revenue, uh, and as is set out in paragraph 235, uh, the difference is uh, th there would have been 2.5% and 7% more revenue in 2015 and 2016 had house prices in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire risen at the Scottish average. So there, there is an effect. Okay, thank you. If I can just focus on the transactions element. So you're uh, saying that there's no link 
but when you're doing the modeling uh, you're not collecting data from the 32 councils how, how do you predict if you're not taking planning data and consents and all the rest of it how are you predicting how many transactions you think should take place well, uh, that's done from from national data um, from data covering the whole of Scotland rather than broken down by by region but potential transactions come through the planning process no, the, no. Um, we, ahead, yeah. we have historical data on the number of transactions um, and we use that to predict um, the path of transactions in the future. So it's a sort of, it's a Scottish wide um, transaction prediction equation which is used there rather than very fine detailed information about planning consents and things like that because that, that would just be an awful lot of work um, and in comparison with this more sort of standard forecasting approach of using historical transaction data. Okay. So, so it's what you're saying, there's no link between the model and what's physically being built on the ground? No, there is a link. Um, there's a very definitive link because it, that, that, what's being built on the ground that, um, feeds into that transactions data. But remember, this is transactions data for the whole market, not just new build. Yeah. So you know, that, those links are, are there, but relatively weak. Thank you. OK, on, I think you're on the same theme, Ivan, or at least on LBTT, am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're on, on tying up the forecast. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mina, thanks, panel, for, for coming along. I'm just looking at your charts where you're bridging between the forecast and the tax raised, um, in particular 2.3 for December 2015 forecast for 2016-17. So just to clarify on that and, and, and to, uh, to get that um, on the record, uh, what you're saying there is that by far the lion's share of the, 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 the difference between the forecast and the outturn was down to average house prices. Um, and that was out by 75 million. Um, and what you're saying on the distribution fit, which I understand it correctly, that if there had been a change in the profile up the, the price bands, um, that's where that would have shown up. So you're saying that was a very minimal impact in the, the, the broad scheme of things, is that correct? It's correct. Right, okay. And then another point, you're talking about behavioural effects. Now, is that um, short term, as in forestalling, or are there other longer term behavioural effects that you're trying to pull in there? Because I'm not quite clear how you would isolate those from what you would see in the, 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 the normal move in um, one of the other factors, be it average house price, median, or, or the log normal. Yes, so the behavioural effects include longer run effects as well as forestalling. Right. Uh, okay. And um, and and and, uh, and uh, we we will continue we will continue to look at both. Right. In some ways, forestalling is easier to look at because forestalling you you can fairly easily see in the data of when you see transactions going down at going up at one point and then going down in the immediately following point. Uh, longer run behavioural effects are are, are 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 harder work because you're there looking at whether in particular areas of the market transactions are falling off because of the effect, not because of the timing of the tax, not because a tax has been introduced, but because we now have a tax at a particular level. But the short answer to your question is, yes, they're, they're both in that figure of behavioural effects mm -hmm. in that diagram, and they both will continue to be parts of right. our forecast. And again, that is fairly small in terms of the overall, overall, overall error there. Compared to the average house price change. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thanks very much. Could I just add there, though, that, that in this particular forecast, that 13 million represents a behavioural adjustment that the government made to its forecasts. So it's not an estimate of the behavioural effects by, by the Commission, it's the adjustment that the government made when it was producing its forecasts. Ah, oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Right. Um, LBTT questions. I mean, I'll come, I'll come back to. Well, Willie, before I move on to, to murder on the non-domestic rates issue, Willie, if it's LBTT. Yep. Yep. So, thank, thanks, Bruce. It's just on that same theme, but in relation to non-res LBTT, you, you mentioned a similar uh, error in calculating that because of the use of averages and the impact that, uh, say, a high-value item will have in skewing the average price of a particular property across the board. So generally, in, in terms of methodology, is it safe to use averages continuously when perhaps maybe the median value of a transaction might be the more accurate value to, to use? I, I, I'll 
I, I'm happy to yeah, go with that too. <laughs> I feel as though I'm at my numerical methods university lecture. <laughs> steps. Um, what's been described there is, is really an inescapable problem that the non residential LBTT um, revenue is heavily influenced by a small number of transactions. Yeah. And uh, there isn't a there isn't a statistical trick that's going to get round that hard reality. So, so looking at medians rather than means uh, is probably not. You know, the, the, you look at me a median rather than a mean if you're looking at a distribution whose shape is very off centre. But if you're looking at an outcome that's just dependent on a few big numbers that might vary a bit. It's just dependent on a few numbers that might vary a bit, and you've got to do your best to to look at past experience and guess. Probably, it's probably more important than trying to be spuriously accurate is forming a good sense of how much uncertainty there is. And, and that's something that is an important part of forecasting. It's as important to tell the user of forecasts how much confidence you have in your central forecast, as you have, as it is to tell them what your central forecast is. And in this area, necessarily, however good you are at forecasting, whatever fancy tricks you use, this is an, an area where your confidence interval is going to be wide because of the nature of the issue that you're looking at. OK. Thank you. <laughs> right. Um, that, I think, deals with LBTT. We'll just keep on the themes at the moment. So we'll deal with the non-domestic rates, Murdo. Uh, thank you, um, Convener. Uh, yes, I want to ask a question about the forecasting on, on non-domestic rates, and there's a comment in your report in relation to the growth in uh, total rateable value for 2016-17. The forecast growth was 1%, whereas the outturn was 0.33%. Now, you know, I appreciate in cash terms that relatively doesn't make a huge sum. It's about £10 million difference. But in percentage terms, it's quite a, quite a major difference. A gap is, is a third of the of the forecast. Can you shed any light on, on why the outturn is so much lower than the, the forecast? To cover that, uh, this gets to the, the, the question of the, the the buoyancy of the change in uh, the increase uh, in uh, non-domestic rates uh, fr from year to year. We have to make an assumption about that, and the the one percent. Um, figure um, that we are ev ev evaluating against was the, the assumption that the, the government made rather than the Fiscal Commission um, made. Uh, and that to, to us uh, last year seemed a reasonable assessment based on what we know about, um, about the, sort of the, the trends in, in buoyancy. However, the, the, uh, I, I would quickly say that we, um, we feel, um, and I think the government uh, statisticians feel, that actually trying to um, provide a statistical estimate of buoyancy based on some form of economic de determinants is an extremely difficult thing, thing to do. Um, and, and in fact, uh, increasingly, that there's a view that um, in the past, the, the, the rate of change of uh, non-domestic rate, rate income can somehow be determined or could, somehow reflects economic circumstances or economic uh, determinants. I think looking at the data then, that while in one sense the, the economy must have some impact on this, um, but it seems to be so uh, far removed from the year-on-year -year changes that you end up in a situation where uh, the, the estimate of, of buoyancy is actually a residual rather than um, something that's based on um, economic determinants. And by definition, perhaps similar to the previous issue on, um, on uh, LBTT, it's, it's very difficult to develop statistical measures to forecast um, some, something like this when it's actually just something that falls out of a whole series of factors that are built into the system around appeals uh, and changes uh, in, in, in the overall system. So I think that the main message was um, it was 
prob it was a reasonable estimate to make at the time um, on something that is an ex a extremely difficult thing to actually forecast and, as you rightly say, has made some difference to, to, to the outturn. Um, but we're not reading too much into it as this reflects a, a, a need for a substantial change to how we make these forecasts in the future. Right. I mean, it sounds, Mr. Wilson, from what you're saying, this is this is a a, a very difficult area to forecast. So, are you, are you just guessing, really, where, where well, the figures will end up? I, I think it would be um, the the term "just guessing" is perhaps <laughs> pejorative in, in this, um, in that a judgment needs to be made um, based on the best possible evidence that you, you can bring to bear. I think what we are. Uh, very, um, very keen to get across to you that these are difficult judgments to make, but we recognise that the, the Commission going forward, um, part of the reason for setting up the Commission was that the, the overall budget process requires somebody to uh, to make a decision on the basis of the best estimate we've got, we've got however difficult it is, and that, that's the role that, that we need, need to play. Okay. Um, I just one follow-up question, Commissioner, if that's okay, just for clarity, because there is mention in your report that one reason why the forecast level of growth was could have been lower than the estimate was that there were several significant removals from the valuation role. Would this what, what does this relate to? Would this property being if demolished? Is that is that, um, that explain that? Does it, um, Again, just to draw the comparison with uh, LBTT instead of, of large transactions, um, you know, without going into the detail of, it, sort of in individual cases, um, but you, there are lar large properties, large facilities that are coming, um, that are le leaving, uh, you know, are no longer uh, in use, and there are new uh, new buildings that are, are being replaced. Uh, I'm not sure if I can, I can quite see it, but the St James Centre is, is an example of of um, a, a, a you know a, a large property um, that is you know changing its its status and 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 its payments and there's a number of these developments both leaving and entering um, in, into the the, the register uh, one th one issue of one area that we could look at is a more uh, detailed you know, listing of major properties that are moving in and out of, of the system and tracking that may help to give an indication of uh, your year-on-year -year changes and that's one something one, one um, area we've we've been looking at but inevitably the timing of the precise changes given review uh, given reviews appeals um, and you know construction timing has been that it's it's a, a fairly demanding task to undertake can I, can I just add a tiny, tiny point, just to put it in very simple terms? Um, there is what is happening on the ground to buildings, as David has just explained, but also over this period, there was also a court decision um, which moved properties into different categories. So there's an administrative um, impact here as well, uh, which also makes it rather complicated. Thank you. Okay, nobody else on non-domestic rates. In that case, we'll just go to a, a more general forecasting issue uh, and, and, the, and the link between this and the fiscal framework. I think it was Marie. Uh, I think, um, it, you know, it, we, we were talking at the beginning about the. It, it, it isn't particularly the, the differential between the forecast and the outturn that's significant. It is maybe um, the difference between the outturn and the block grant adjustment. And I just wondered, you know, given the complexity that we have as a devolved nation, um, there is an added layer of complication. Um, and I just wondered if you would be able to give us a little bit more explanation on how your forecasting fits back in with the fiscal framework. Uh, sorry, um, I'm just trying to pinpoint what you're looking for. How does our forecasting affect the block grant negotiation so or outcome? The, or so, so it it feeds back into the um, relates back to the fiscal framework. So there is there is this the amount of money. I'm not getting this right at all. The amount of money that uh, you forecast, and then there's the amount of money that we collect, and there's the amount of money that they forecast in the UK government, and there's the amount of money that they collect, and then there's an adjustment that happens between the two governments. And I just wondered if you could give us a little bit more, sorry to be so simplistic, a little bit more explanation around that. 
I, I think you've got it. I, yeah. um, so the block grant adjustment depends upon the, the, the difference between um, the, the Scottish revenue raised and the, the rest of the UK revenue raised. Um, we, for, we forecast the Scottish component of that. Mm -hmm. The OBR by default forecasts the, um, the rest of the UK part of that. And those two things will give you the block grant adjustment, um, which is the government's additional money. Yeah. So I think you've got, you've got it exactly. All right. Right. Okay. So. In that case, uh, move on to the readiness of the organisation in more general terms. James. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, convener. And good morning, panel. Um, Lady Rice, you spoke in your opening statement about um, readiness for producing your first official forecast later in the year. Um, and in terms of you know being able to do that, you know as I see it, there are three strands. You know, there's a the resource you need to do that, and you outlined. 15 staff that you're taking on, there are the models uh, that you use and other the methodologies that underpin those models. Can you maybe just give a bit of an overview of how robust you feel all that is as you move towards the production of your first official forecast? Yeah, I'll give you perhaps just an overview comment and then turn to John, who's been um, so key in, in pulling so much of this together over recent months as the chief executive. Um, so we, as I said, I think we have a really good team. We still have a couple more people due to join us. So, you know, it's, uh, it is forming still, but um, they're working well together. They really do bounce off each other well. Um, um, and, uh, and we're pleased with the people we have. We do think that we have the resources we need for our remit and our responsibilities this year. If we find in a few years' time that the remit grows, we will obviously need to have more resource. We don't have any, anybody spare um, at all at the moment. Um, so, so we do think we have the, um, the, the people, uh, and um, we um, have helped... Um, uh, us develop our own views as commissioners because ultimately we are responsible for the forecasts that are produced in December by bringing in the experts that I mentioned in my opening comments. Um, and their job was just to bring another independent view. They, they were doing this at the behest of ourselves. Um, um, by going into the uh, forecasts, and then they reported back to us as commissioners and to members of our senior team, and overall, with lots of thoughts and suggestions and interesting points, but overall, in all cases, they felt that we were on track. So we take some comfort from that, in addition to our own personal judgments that, uh, that we would be um, on track. In terms of the models used, we've, uh, in essence, and we have the report called our our current approach to forecasting, which summarizes some of this, um, we're, we're building on models for the taxes that already existed in a devolved form. We're building on those models. We did judge these to be reasonable with some challenges um, in the past few years, and we think they're a good place to start. That doesn't mean that um, they will be the same forever, because what we're doing is enhancing and, and changing over time. For some of the new devolved taxes, so a lot of work's being done on air departure tax um, that we have to build ourselves, obviously. We're looking at social security expenditure for those categories that we're responsible for in the first instance, and we're building that new, obviously. Um, but John, do you want to say anything more about our resources overall? Um, I think Susan's probably covered the sort of resources that we have access to, and also the sort of the evolution of our models from those that we inherited from the government and those that we've built in-house. Perhaps I could just add a little bit about quality assurance. Um, we have sort of three levels of quality assurance of, of the modelling that work that we've been doing um, over the course of the past year. Um, first of all, there's an internal challenge. So um, the, the, um, the commissioners have been working very closely with the staff um, to sort of go through the models. So we have that internal challenge process. Um, we've been working very closely too with the government analysts, so um, we've been taking back the models um, that we, we took from them and talking through our changes and explaining them and getting their feedback on those changes. Um, we've been working with external people such as David um, Eisner at the Fraser Under Institute on things like our income tax model. And the other thing that we've done, as Susan has said in some detail, um, we employed three academics from, 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 from the South to come up and give us some sort of, over the course of sort of um, three or four days, to give us their sort of insights into the modelling. 
that we did, we've been doing. So we, we've sort of gone through that sort of process of quality assurance, and we're reasonably confident that you know, at the moment we're in a, we're in a good, good starting place for our forecasting. So just in terms of that quality assurance check, is that in terms of, if you like, the, the actual kind of process of the model? Um, have you done any testing based on, uh, you know, uh, numbers? Uh, yes. So, um, so the, the the experts and our our, our quality assurance has been looked um, both at the ability of the models to forecast um, and also their methodological approach. You know, is this? I think one of the questions earlier was about is you know is this a state of the art approach or are there alternatives? We've we've assessed that, but for sure we've been looking at how well the models perform. The forecast evaluation report we've just been discussing is an important part of that, but also um, we have internally been doing sort of very similar sort of exercises. So a, a new area of forecasting for us is forecasting the macro economy. Um, we've constructed models, and we've also been using the NISA SGEM model, which the, was built for the Scottish Government as a framework, and over the summer we've been producing dummy macro forecasts. So we're now, I think, in, in about our third round of internal forecasting using that sort of framework. So we, yes, we've been, we've been producing numbers and right. running our eyes over them. So it's an iterative process? An iterative in process, sense, yes. In the sense that you've, you, you've taken soundings from experts on the methodology, you've run actual uh, tests, or in some cases, live data that you'll have available through it, and you, you continue to check that through. Yeah, very much so. Thanks, James. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a follow-up on one aspect of methodology, which takes us a little bit beyond the evaluation report. So it might be that you're not prepared for this and you want to come back to us in, in, in writing, and if that's, if that's the case, that's absolutely fine. But, uh, but Lady Susan, you've mentioned a couple of times this morning, both in your um, opening remarks and in your answer to Mr. Kelly just there, um, that the uh, Fiscal, Fiscal Commission is taking on new responsibilities, has already taken on new responsibilities with regard to um, making official forecasts for spending in devolved social security. And I wanted to ask if you, um, you know, what, what kind of methodological challenges you've had in terms of developing models f f for that and how, how you're overcoming them. Uh, uh, do you want to pick up on Social Security or um, 80? Well, may, let me take air passenger, Judy. Social Security is not, um, will be responsible in the first instance for about 2, 2.5, 2.8 billion of our 40 billion spend. So it's a, a few programs within Social Security. Um, and part of what you have to do to begin with is to understand how those programs will work, how uh, we anticipate or we hear that they may change as they're devolved and administered from Scotland. Um, uh, so so I'll, I'll put that aside just for the moment, though, because air uh, departure tax or a passenger duty, as it might have been called, um, is, a, is an interesting space. Um, getting the uh, understanding what numbers are included um, in, in, you know, what is the what are the base base number of uh, passengers departing? What are the categories? It's just literally starting at the beginning. Um, so some of the information on passenger numbers relate to surveys that are done. You know, you may have been stopped in an airport at some point, and so it's where are you going? And if you say London, you, you, you go into the counter. If you say you're en route to somewhere else, you don't. Um, it's understanding just what the baseline numbers are, just as with the additional dwelling supplement. In the first year, we had to have proxies for understanding that. So um, I, I, I'm not sure if that's what your question is, but we have to start there. I guess at this stage, you, you don't know what the baseline numbers are in the social security field. I guess that's what you're telling us there. And John, I can see you beavering away trying to find an answer there. But but so but I think it's better if you if you if you go and reflect on that and just let us know about what your early preparation is to begin. Dealing I with these. can point to where that information is now, if that's helpful. Okay. okay that's so the, um, the paper that Susan referred to that we published, the current approach to forecasting um, paper, the, the method paper, that has a section, section 8, which sort of outlines where we are on, on, on social security modelling. There's, the government has been working on, on this for some time. We, we've been working pretty closely with the government. The, the government has <laughs> access to DWP data, which gives us a fair amount of historical data. Um, there are, I think, particularly difficult methodological issues when it comes to things like take-up. Um, and I think that's where our judgment and our work is going to be really focused, that um, it's you can get reasonable data on sort of health characteristics of the population, not perfect, but reasonable. But there are, um, 
if, if the aim in the sense of the Scottish approach to social security is to operate a kinder system, um, to sort of reflect some of the language and the programme for government, um, how you actually model that in terms of hard take-up data is, is, is quite a challenge, I think. And I think that's where our judgment is going to be sort of most needed. OK, we have signposted as to where, yeah. this, where the material is available at this stage. Just a very, very brief point, which is, uh, I think, Hopefully one of the things that has, has be, become clear is that we take a different approach to forecasting the different areas of our responsibilities depending on the needs of that, that particular approach. I mean, for example, the developing work on forecasting onshore uh, GDP is, is very much a, um, a combination of statistical models and overall judgment about the development of, of the economy, which both requires an expertise in modelling and, and data, uh, also quite a significant amount of engagement with um, external commentators, with people who, um, you know, business representatives and others who are also thinking very actively about, about these issues, and that will all feed into the work that we're doing. So it's not all just about the modelling, it's also about external engagement on, on that one through a variety of different, uh, different uh, processes. And just to pick up the, uh, the, the work on social, social security, m much of that is about engagement with the teams who are implementing the new approaches that the, the Scottish Government are going to take and developing a, a very specific set of expertise and understanding about the possible um, you know, expenditures. So it's, it's partly the develops all, development of uh, statistical models to do that, but a big part of our work at the moment is active engagement with the teams who are developing and implementing those systems so that we can work with them to make sure there's an understanding of, of expenditure. So I just wanted to clarify, it's not, it's not all just about having a single model that will give us all the answers. There's a significant amount of engagement and working collaboratively with uh, various organisations in order to, to produce the, the estimates. That's helpful, thanks. Thanks. I've got one final question before I go there. Has anyone else got another question? Patrick. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I wanted to ask a question not about the doing of the work, uh, which is extremely complicated for most people, including ourselves, to understand, but about the communicating of it. Um, we're all very familiar, for example, with the, the political impact of uh, something like the JERS publication, which uh, Whatever you think about why it is what it is, it, it tends to further the polarisation about the stories we tell each other about the, the Scottish economy, rather than really shedding light uh, on things. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the publication of your forecasting doesn't become a similarly polarising political event in the year, and also that the publication of the block grant adjustment uh, doesn't become just an opportunity for us all as politicians to say, well, it proves exactly what we've been saying all along. You know, that, that's not a very helpful uh, dynamic uh, generally. We're all guilty of that, but there's an opportunity for you as an independent body uh, to become more of a source of publicly accessible authoritative information. Uh, most people, to be fair, are not going to have hours to spend reading and get wrapping their heads around the detailed reports that you publish. So I'm, I'm wondering about how you intend to go about communicating in more accessible ways uh, the key findings uh, that, that are, are coming out of your, uh, your reports, or indeed whether you're going to engage with moments like uh, the, 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 the confirmation of what the block grant adjustment will be, and whether you see part of your role as informing the public about how those things have come about and what they really mean. Your, your social media account, for example, uh, is active, but it mostly includes just links to your main publications rather than anything that's perhaps more uh, digestible. Well, we have a social media account now, so we're, you know, we're moving on in, in, in that score. Let me just say that the issue you raise is a really important one and one that we're conscious of, we care about, and we speak about amongst ourselves a lot. Um, I'll give you a couple of answers, but look to my colleagues as well. Last year, in the report we issued alongside the draft budget, so those were not our forecasts, but we commented on them, um, we did put an executive summary in the front. And the, and the purpose of that was when we read the content of the report, we thought, gosh, there will be a lot of people who um, won't find this really accessible. Let's try to articulate what we're talking about with those 
few small number of devolved taxes mm. in a way that might be uh, more accessible. We think that's important. We intend to use our website as well to um, you know to clarify and to speak in in easy language, if you will. We also have those who are highly technical who want the technical sure, side. So we absolutely. need to do both. Um, in terms of commenting, we will be able to comment about the work that we're responsible to do because we understand that and and that we can comment on that. Mm -hmm. We will not be commenting on um, other aspects of the fiscal infrastructure if it doesn't, you know, if we are not expert in in that space. So mm. we won't be making, uh, we won't be commentators in that sense about other matters that are outside our purview. We wouldn't be expert at that, and and I don't think that would be helpful. Um, anything about communications, John? You think a lot about that. I think on 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 top of the. Um, the, the structure of the executive summary um, and the main reports are trying to keep the executive summary very non-technical. Um, I think there's enormous value in charts. And I think today's yeah. Yeah. questions have illustrated particularly those LBTT decomposition charts that some carefully chosen charts can do an awful lot. So we are spending quite a lot of time thinking about the charts that we produce and how we sort of use those in, in perhaps social media as mm. well. No, I think that's helpful. Uh, uh, last year, I think um, some of these are from uh, December last year, you produced a series of, of infographics. Uh, charts would be one stage beyond yep. that kind of simplistic yep. kind of visual present presentation of a single statistic. Uh, but I, I think there'd be I think there'd be great value in ensuring that the commission is seen as a source not just of detailed information for uh, government and for and for academics and for for people who want to explore that detail, but also a, a, a source of authoritative clear information for uh, people who, who might only be reading the headlines. And we endorse that view. David, did you want to add a comment? I just very much I want to say I think a couple of things. One, very much welcome uh, what you're saying in terms of the role of the Commission. And just to build on what, uh, what Susan ha has said, I think we're very conscious that there are some very major issues which will underpin um, the, the forecasts that we'll make, of which the, you know, there's significant political interest. Uh, you know, for example, on page 12 of the, of the report, there's a, a graph about uh, the, um, the current position on productivity trends, um, which and, you know, it's, it's often said in terms of both growth of incomes, you know, what's you know, wage, wage income in people's pockets, uh, and also go government uh, you know, fiscal revenues. Um, it's not all about productivity, but just, just about mo mo most of it actually is. So issues about the, the fundamentals of what's happening in the economy around productivity, about behavioural responses to any tax changes, um, about how the, uh, the, the flight path, as uh, Susan put, put it earlier, of how things will develop. We recognise and very much want to take on the role of communicating some of the major issues that, that, that they uh, underpin. But perhaps just, just do want to add a, a, a slight caveat in terms of the wider issues about the block grant adjustment. Mm. I mean, our role we see very much as principally about assessing the, the income side of the balance sheet in terms of where um, the, the uh, incomes that the Scottish Government uh, will, will receive um, from the, the devolved taxes rather than the wider set of questions about the fiscal framework, mm. which is very much for the governments re respectively to sort out in, in themselves. You know, we, we play a key part of that overall framework but it's perhaps for others to be developing the more detailed understanding of the, you know, the precise minutiae of how the block grant adjustment will be taken mm. forward rather than us. That's helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah, helpful. Good. Thank you very much. That actually goes into some of the areas I was going to cover myself. So I think that all needs to, remains to say is thank you very much for coming along this morning. It was very helpful. It's thrown us not on a light on your forecasting figures, but beginning to allow us to understand some of the journey you're on as well. So we're very grateful for your attendance this morning. I now suspend the meeting to allow changeover of witnesses.
Uh, hello. Um, the next item on our agenda is to take evidence from the Scottish Government Bill Team on Social Security Scotland Bill's financial memorandum. And I welcome to the meeting Chris Boyle and the Legislation Delivery Team Leader, Chris Stevens, who is the Senior Finance Business Partner. David, now forgive me if I don't get this right, David. Signorio Signori. Signorini. Signorini. I didn't get it right either term, so thank you for helping me out. <laughs> James Wallace, who's the Head of uh, Finance and Social Security Division. Um, I think all members have received copies of the written submissions received by the committee, along with a briefing from SPICE and a paper from the clerks. So I think we'll just go straight to the questions. Uh, but thank you for coming along this morning um, and, and to give us evidence as part of the financial memorandum on the Social Security Bill. Um, the written submissions, which I've already just, uh, talked about, highlighted some of the demand-led nature of the majority of devolved security benefits, and that will bring with it uncertainty and a new budget risk, which the Scottish Government will have to, to, to manage. But specifically, there are also new risks associated with the block grant adjustment mechanism as each benefit is devolved. And I just wondered how the Scottish Government intends to manage those budgetary risks and ensure it can meet the costs of providing these social security benefits when devolved to Scotland, particularly in regard to the, at this stage, the, the, the block grant adjustment process. I know that Ash Denham has got a question on the, the wider range of risks. So if you could concentrate on the beginning on the block grant adjustment risks, I'd be most grateful. Who wants to take that on? James, on you go. Doing this wrong. Um, so the there, are, there is a risk created um, as a result of the block grant adjustment. Um, the, the fiscal framework agreement between the UK and the Scottish Government sets out the arrangements by which the block grant adjustment will operate. Um, so the, the block grant is essentially based on uh, expenditure in Scotland in the year prior to devolution. Um, so if we were to devolve a benefit in 1819, it would be based on DWP's forecast from 1718. Um, that adjustment is made as an, an initial adjustment to the, to the block grant for the Scottish Government as a whole. Um, and then it would be reconciled in line with the fiscal framework. Um, the technical annex for the fiscal framework sets out that that reconciliation can be done in year. Um, so if there were, were variations down south um, from forecast um, and expenditure was tracking against a different trajectory to the forecast, then that adjustment could be made uh, through the autumn budget uh, down south um, and, and the rest of the UK and adjusted through supplementary estimates in year. Um, it does uh, create a risk, however, in terms of cash management for the Scottish Government in year. Um, should the, the, the forecasts track away from actual expenditure, then we may have um, a, a requirement in year to pay more in cash than is actually um, been transferred through the through the budget, um, and then the, those those two would converge together later in the year. Um, the, the, the method by which we, we attempt to manage that risk, I'll perhaps comment on, and then and then ask Kevin to comment further on. Um, I th for us, it's around our forecasts. Um, th there are a number of uh, analysts working in the Scottish Government preparing detailed forecasts of of. Uh, likely expenditure on benefits, um, which will be used to inform um, our view on whether the block grant adjustment is appropriate. Um, the Scottish Fiscal Commission will, will prepare forecasts, um, and the OBR will prepare forecasts on which essentially the, the block grant adjustment is based. Um, so it, it is a new risk, I think. Um, it's, it's something that we are we are very live to, um, and we are putting in, in place arrangements to manage. I don't know if Kevin would, would care to add. <coughs> <coughs> oh, don't worry about it. Sorry. Right. Um, yes, we are building uh, procedures and processes um, in, in different ways. So for, there, are, there are three main areas um, that we are uh, looking at. Um, in the Social Security Directorate, we, are, we have a finance hub which will be staffed uh, by appropriately uh, professionally qualified people to um, manage the, the finances there. Um, central finance. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be working closely um, with, with the Social Security Finance Hub. We'll have good working relationships there. Um, we're, we're developing good working relationships with Communities Analysis Division so we can make sure that we understand the internal Scottish Government forecasts um, and that we embed new processes into the business as usual financial management of this, this Scottish um, 
Scottish Government. Um, we have good working relationships with, with HM Treasury as well. Um, and indeed, clearly, there will be links to the work that the Scottish Fiscal Commission um, will do. So it's, it's clearly a complex area, but we are, we are looking at setting up robust, transparent processes where all these areas that I have outlined can, can all work together um, productively. Kevin, thanks, James. Tell me a bit more about you, the, the, you obviously got a, a, a risk to manage and then there will be a reconciliation process at some stage. Can you just talk us through about that? Because if there is either an up or a down for the Scottish Government, that will need to work its way through the system and it will come a date about when that, all that will be reconciled. You want, I don't know who wants to take that on. but I, I will again. Uh, thank you. Um, essentially, um, the, the, the reconciliation process is, is described in the fiscal framework and its technical annex. Um, it was agreed between or recognised between the UK government and the Scottish government when the fiscal free framework was negotiated, um, that, that, that there was a, a risk of variations. I should say that it is, it is variations for a particular reason. It is where expenditure is, is deviating from the forecast. It is not um, as a result of policy changes, demographic changes, um, or, or divergence between the way expenditure grows in Scotland and expenditure grows in the rest of the UK. That will need to be accounted for differently. Um, so it, it is particularly particularly sort of forecast error um, as a result of the way the initial block grant adjustment is calculated. Because it's calculated in, in year one and um, for, for the, the year preceding devolution, there does we, we know straight away that we require to be an indexation adjustment to account for the, the movement in a year forward. Um, but we, we are also aware that the, the, the nature of, of the expenditure as demand led um, means that we are not working with an expenditure limit. We are working with um, with, with expenditure based on demand, um, so it will be what it is based on the factors that affect demand, um, and we will require to, to make sure that we are adjusting uh, the block grant accordingly. Um, linked to that, um, the, the fiscal framework describes a number of new um, sort of cash management and resource borrowing powers, um, in particular for, for cash management and for, for forecast error that allow the, Sc the Scottish Government um, to draw on those resource borrowing powers along with the Scotland Reserve to ensure that we can manage the cash flow of the Scottish Government um, prior to the, the in-year adjustment, if, if we choose an in-year adjustment, but prior to that in-year adjustment uh, taking place through the the supplementary estimate process down south. Okay, and I know Ash Denham had questions specifically about the demand-led um, risks. So Ash. Yes, so you've just mentioned in your answer there, James, about the factors that will affect the demand. So clearly, you know, there are going to be risks to the, the public finances created by managing a demand-led um, expenditure on this type of scale. So could you maybe outline for us what you see those risks as being? The, the, the main risks, I, I would say, are, are policy and demographic, I think, as the financial memorandum goes into in, in, in detail. Um, I think the, the, the way um, in which uh, population changes in Scotland, an ageing population, could encourage a greater growth in, in some of the, the devolved benefits over uh, the rest of the UK. Um, the, the policy differentials, I, I think the Scottish Minister have a desire to to, to change policy in some areas, um, some some of those are, are outlined in the financial memorandum, and um, that will cause divergence over time from from the UK government's position. Um, those um, th those differences will not be accounted for through the block grant adjustment. It will be for the Scottish government um, to make up the any any shortfall through the Scottish government's own resources through the spending review process and through the, the annual budget process. Um, I, sh I should add for balance that there, there is also the possibility of, of a variance downwards. Um, that it is not necessarily the case that, that expenditure will rise um, above um, comparable UK spending. It could also fall below UK spending, um, depending uh, again on, on policy and demographic differences, um, which would which would release money into the Scottish government budget effectively. Okay, so you've mentioned there things like ageing population. Obviously, we can, to a degree, predict that what that might be in the future, and policy change. Obviously, you would know before you were going to change it what that likely impact of that would have. So, is there anything in there that you would see as being less predictable that maybe um, we wouldn't be able to predict in advance? Um, there, there, there are there are difficulties in, in prediction. Um, I, I think it, it is 
there is there's, there is always an inherent uncertainty in forecasting, um, and that is that is one thing that I think our, our analyst colleagues are, are are working through to to understand where these variances are going to occur. How can we improve our modelling to ensure that that we are in the best position to forecast um, expenditure? Um, there, there 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 will be occasions where it is, is difficult to. To forecast, particularly some of the areas around uptake, mm. um, uptake on benefits, there are um, incomplete data sets. I would describe them as, um, and where we have incomplete da data sets, that obviously affects the, the the validity of the forecasting that we're able to do. Um, but again, our, our analyst colleagues are, are well aware of these limitations um, and, are, and are working to 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 uh, to, to to are working on new models to enable them to. To, to either gather the data or, or get round the, the data limitations. I may see if Kevin's got anything to add there on forecasting. I think as the social security system in Scotland um, diverges, perhaps, from uh, the UK level, um, assessing the impact of changes to the Scottish system in terms of take-up will be uh, you know, a new area and an inherent source of uncertainty, um, which is why um, the analysts are, are, are developing their capability to produce models to um, to, to try and you know, forecast the effect um, of, of those changes, acknowledging that the um, current um, evidence base um, of take-up rates in the existing system is, is limited, as, as James says. Okay, thank you. I mean, he's indicated he's got a supplementary in this area. Yes, just to a bit more on, on, on that, that line. Um, on demographic profile. Um, and I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the way that the BGA, certainly on the tax side, the way it's, it works, and I'm assuming it's the same here, is there's an adjustment made to take account of overall population. Yeah. So the issue you're talking about in demographics is the profile of the population within that overall population number, um, and specifically around the ageing population, or conversely, the lack of working age population. So is there a risk there in terms of where we are with population growth, specifically on immigration, um, that could impact that, and also potentially an opportunity there um, in terms of if Scotland had a differential immigration policy post-Brexit that would allow us to grow that working age population, that would give us an advantage, potentially significant, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the way that the BGA is calculated, just looking at the way that the numbers are calculated, obviously without commenting on the, the policy as such, but just the way that those numbers flow through, is that correct? There hasn't been specific modelling done um, on this on the scenario you describe, mm -hmm. as far as I'm, I'm aware. Um, but but my understanding would would be that you're correct. Um, that that if if the population were to grow, um, then it could um, increase. Uh, well, in, in a wider economic sense, it could increase tax receipts, which would push more. Uh, receipts into the uh, Scottish Consolidated Fund, which would make him, uh, more funding available to pay for benefits. Um, but the, the population growth um, should um, be accounted for in that way through the index per capita model. Kevin, do you want to comment yeah, on I th this? I think, I think that's a fair comment, James. I think I'd also highlight that the benefits which are being devolved, um, as, as set out in the financial memorandum, are related to uh, disability and age-related benefits. They're not primarily benefits that are related to you know, economic activity. Um, so our focus is very much on understanding the, the behaviours of these benefits that are being devolved in, in the Scottish system. Yeah, but to just to clarify, so in, in that scenario where the working age population is a percentage of the top population grew, Meaning that the elderly population, as I was saying, the top population was reducing. Not only would you get increased tax take, you would also get a benefit from the BGA specifically on the social security aspect. Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, moving into issues around setup costs, and I think Adam Tompkins had a, a question around that. Th thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I just want to see if I've understood the numbers correctly. It's highly, highly, late, highly likely that I haven't, and you, and you, you can correct me. But as, as I understand it, the projected set-up costs for the new Scottish Social Security Agency are estimated at £308 million over four years. And the um, uh, fiscal framework, in the fiscal framework, the UK government agreed to make a one-off transfer of £200 million, 
200 million being quite a lot smaller as a number than 308 million. And also that the estimated running costs of the agency um, are around 150 million annually, um, which again exceeds by some considerable margin the value of the 66 million pounds annually to be transferred from the UK government. Are, that, are those numbers broadly correct? Yes, they are. Um, so w w why are the numbers that the Scottish government are giving so much greater than the amount of money that will be transferred from the UK? Um, I, I think others before me have, have commented widely on the fiscal framework. Um, the, the fiscal framework, my understanding of it, was it, it, it represents, um, in, in the Scottish Government's view, a fair financial settlement. Um, it wasn't the total that the Scottish Government asked for. Um, and it was the, the transfers were only ever intended to, to represent a share of implementation costs and administration costs. They were never um, expected to be the total amounts. Um, so I, I, I don't see a relationship between the two in terms of one should cover the other. Okay. Um, that, that was not the way the fiscal framework was designed. Okay. Um, but we, as I said, I think we do believe it as a fair financial settlement. The, 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 the £200 million on implementation, the, the £66 million on administration, um, which are for all of the Scotland Act 2016 powers, not just Social Security, um, can be topped up by the Scottish Government's own resource to enable us to implement um, the system and run the system for Social Security in Scotland. Okay, that, that, that's very helpful. Thank you. So, the, so, the, the, so the, the margin between those two sets of figures, 308 versus 200 and 150 versus 66, is to be met from within the Scottish Government's own budget? It will require to be, yes. Okay, thanks. Can I just ask you a, 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 a slightly unrelated follow-up question about, about what is not included within the financial memorandum, unless I've missed it, and if I have missed it, then, then, then forgive me, but I couldn't find anything in the financial memorandum about costs associated with the proposed charter um, on social security rights. Is, is, is that correct? That is correct, to an extent. Um, the the Agency running costs, which are, are, are uh, detailed in the financial memorandum, are based on the, the outline business case for Social Security in Scotland, which was published by the Scottish Government. Um, the outline business case um, create or, or analysed the costs um, from DWP to, to build what we call the current activity-based model. Um, DWP supply does with uh, detailed activity-based information on cost, um, which we were able to, to build a model essentially to, to work out um, in a robust evidence-based way what a, an agency in Scotland is likely to cost us. Um, our, our, our view is that within those costs would be the cost of reviewing the charter, um, that we don't believe those costs to be significantly uh, above uh, a, a sort of material threshold um, that, that would would cause a requirement to, to update the figures beyond what, See, what that, I've already that, prepared. That, that, that puzzles me, and it puzzles me for this reason, because the um, I mean, I, one of the principal features, that, features of the Social Security Bill um, is that it seeks to put devolved Scottish Social Security on a, on a human rights footing. Um, and one of the most important of all human rights is the right to have your rights enforced in a court of law. And so it puzzles me that there has been no thought given to the extent to which there will be inevitably increased litigation costs that will have to be borne by the Scottish budget because of the way in which um, uh, Social Security is being put on a human rights footing in this, in, in this bill. Uh, and I, I, I don't really understand why that isn't above what you just described as a material threshold. Our, our current view um, is that the, the, the cost will not be significant. However, perhaps I can I can expand on on how we will take the f costs forward from where they are at, at the moment in the financial memorandum. So, as I've described, we've used the current uh, activity-based model um, to to define the costs as as recorded in the financial memorandum. Um, I think the the outline business case goes on to discuss the future activity-based model, um, which our analyst colleagues are developing. Um, the the Cost information at the moment, the, the, the best information we have available is based on historic information. We are conscious that we will do things differently from the way DWP do things, that there may be variations in cost as a result. Um, so at the moment, our colleagues are working on um, a, a future activity-based model which maps out the 2B systems and processes of a new agency for Scotland, which will enable us to wrap cost information around those future processes and systems. That may flush out some variances 
um, the likes of which you, you, you describe. Um, however, uh, as I say, at, at the current time, our view is that the cost will not be significant. Okay. Um, but we've introduced issues about information provided by the DWP, and I know that Patrick had a specific question around that from the spice paper that we were provided um, about estimates that the DWP and costs. So, Patrick, you want to go in that area? I'll bring you back in later yeah. in your wider area. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning. Um, the um, model that you described, the activity-based model that you described, that, that it is the basis for your uh, the Scottish Government's uh, estimates of DWP costs of administering uh, devolved benefits in Scotland. Um, just so that I'm, I'm clear that I understand, that's about calculating a cost that DWP will be uh, provided by the Scottish Government for its continuing ad administration. No? Sorry, it's not. So this no. is after the period of DWP administration? The, the, this, the, the DWP provided us with detailed cost information, which we've used to build a model to model a, a potential social security agency for Scotland. Um, so we have used this information as a, as a historic basis of how much administering benefits costs the DWP and applied that to a Scottish situation to enable so this, us... So this doesn't at all relate to what DWP will continue to administer in the short term? Oh, well, uh, no, sorry, yes, absolutely, put, put that way, yes. Um, the, it is based on their cost information, so the, the, the cost information that, that DWP has supplied us is, is in relation to their operations, and if their operations continue, then it will, it will in a way, relate, an element of it anyway, will relate to the, the, a, any benefits that they continue to administer. So have they agreed to that estimate? To our estimate. Have they agreed with the estimate that you've made? I, I don't believe so. Isn't that going to be important to get agreement on what the, the cost of administration is going to be for the agency in Scotland? We well, sorry, we haven't used this information to estimate funding flows from the Scottish government to the DWP. Um, it is their cost information, so what it costs them, I would assume it will continue to cost them. Um, but that does not relate to to funding flows between the Scottish government and the UK government. So what's the what's the reason why? the estimate of the Scottish agency's running costs would be lower as a percentage of the, the overall benefits being administered. You, you've said it's 6.3% as the current DWP costs, 6.3% of the, the benefits they administer is the administrative cost. You're suggesting it's going to be 5% for a Scottish agency. Why can you say with confidence that that's going to be that, that lower administrative cost? I, I, I think the, the, the analysis is, is intended to show that we are uh, within a margin of error. Um, we are forecasting here, so there are margins mm -hmm. of errors involved. Um, it, is, it is to show that the, the methodology by which we have uh, estimated the cost of the agency in Scotland are, is, is, has been done on a robust basis and is comparable with DWP. I don't believe it is intended to show that that we are going to be lower than DWP. Um, related to that, I think, as the future activity-based model, these, are not, these will not be the final costs of the agency in Scotland. They are our current estimates based on our current design assumptions. As the, as the programme to implement Social Security in Scotland matures, as decisions are taken on, on, on how we will administer benefits, on the exact setup of the agency, processes may change um, and costs will, will require to be reviewed. And can you say anything about the, the current nature of the administration that the DWP has been doing that in future will be done in Scotland? Um, for example, uh, does any of this relate to um, benefits that are currently administered by way of paper records in warehouses in London that would need to be moved up here and separated out by geography when at the moment they're only... Uh, they're only stored according to, to, to name rather than uh, having a, a separate batch that's, that, that can be easily moved that, that relate to Scotland. Uh, I may be able to bring Chris in there if that's OK. The industrial injuries disablement benefit is currently entirely paper-based. I don't know where the warehouse is, but <laughs> um, that one um, I, I know with confidence is, is currently a paper-based administration. And is the intention simply to move the paper uh, or to digitise it in the process or administer it in a completely different way? We don't, I think, have a decision on that point. 
um, before we would do anything, we would need to identify the um, records relating to Scottish recipients. Mm. The the sorting job would be the would be the first and arguably the most important part of that process. And presumably, the, the DWP would have to do that because it's who, not, wherever the warehouse is, I'm it's not their warehouse. Sure that they would physically have to provide the staff to do that. Um, I couldn't be definite okay. on that point. I mean, it, it, it does just leave me still a little bit unclear as to how the Scottish Government can be confident of a, a lower administrative cost compared with the, the scale of the benefit being administered if even principal decisions like how it's going to be done physically haven't been made yet. <coughs> We did, um, we, did, we did a detailed analytical piece of work that took DWP's database uh, around, so the DWP database, the, the, the current activity based model um, that they provided, that we, that we built from their, their, their data. Um, our analysts looked at that in a lot of detail in terms of caseload, new cases coming into the system, um, cases leaving the system. We built up a very granular understanding as, as to how the, the flows might work for the different benefits. Um, we made assumptions around um, corporate costs, like running costs, audit costs, internal audit costs. We built up a picture um, of what we think it would cost DWP to administer the current system mm. in Scotland, because DWP do not provide separate statistics yeah. on, on on Scottish That's running the costs. Whole so, so we've we've so we did that exercise to, and and then we we, we overlaid some assumptions around you know, how it would run in Scotland um, to provide a sort of broad indication of the figure. And that gives us a good benchmark as to what we think it might cost in Scotland. But the important point moving forwards will be the future activity-based model. So we have service design experts on the social security programme that are designing new fit-for-purpose processes um, to support a new organisation. Um, we have analysts in Communities Analysis Division who are building detailed models to model the future. And so the links between the service design and the analytical piece will, en will enable us to understand how much it will cost to administer the system in the future. However, we know that the assumptions we've currently made are reasonable because they, they broadly tie in with what we estimate it costs to run the system at the moment. Okay, I think it's crossed. <laughs> James, I think you wanted to talk about IT issues and the costs around that specifically. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the financial memorandum, you have uh, 190 million pounds of IT setup costs. Um, clearly, in, in previous projects, both in Scotland and the UK, the IT costs have been an issue that can sometimes spiral out of control. So it's important that you know that that figure is robust. So can you give some indication as to how what, what does 190 million pounds entail? I can. Um, the the you I, I think it's probably important to say first off that the 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 financial memorandum makes clear that there are a number of decisions on detailed design still to be made. Um, that costs will vary materially um, as a result of um, decisions on what we buy, how we buy it, and when we buy it. Um, the, the, uh, the Scottish Government have taken the view that we wish to provide the committee with as much information as possible um, on implementation to enable uh, scrutiny um, of costs. Um, but I, I think it's important to mention the caveats within the financial memorandum. Um, the, the figure of £190 million within the financial memorandum is based on a specific set of assumptions that we will design and build our own system for, for, for IT, for a social security agency in Scotland. That may not be the method by which we, we do it. We, we may reuse where appropriate. We may buy customisable off-the-shelf packages, um, which, which could push costs down. Um, in terms of coming to this figure, um, our, our, our colleagues um, within the, the Social Security programme have, have been able to scope out um, exactly what they would intend to build or possibly build for a system in, in Scotland um, and wrap costs around those. Um, we've then taken the Treasury Green Book um, and applied appropriate optimism bias within uh, the, the, the cost figures that they're, they're presenting. Um, as, this is, as, as the process moves forward and evolves and some of the decisions are taken around 
uh, detailed design of the system, um, uh, more information will become available on IT. We would expect that to be supported and we will ensure that's supported by, by a business case um, that follows the Green Book and follows the five case model and, and the, and the uh, sort of best standard uh, methodology and um, will apply optimism bias where necessary and, and the appropriate amounts uh, per the Green Book to make sure that we are accounting for the, the possibility that costs may rise beyond the, 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 the business case at the beginning. I don't know if Kevin wants to add to that. I think um, it, within the programme there will be business cases um, at project level. Um, we will be happy to, to share those uh, business cases. Um, with with committee and indeed um, you know publish them in in due course so that we can you know provide the evidence base for spending decisions. Uh, so if just sorry, just if it's at all helpful, the Minister for Social Security wrote to the convener of the Social Security Committee last week, attaching a couple of things. One of which was a ver relatively brief, fairly short update on. Um, IT implementation for Social Security. We could obviously arrange that members uh, receive that as well. Uh, just pick up on a couple of points there. Uh, are you saying that the assumption is that you will build the system in-house? You won't, you won't outsource it? The, the, the cost within the financial memorandum uses the assumption that the system will be built in-house, um, but no decision within the programme has been taken on what we will actually do in practice, it will, de it will depend and it may be that different parts are done in different ways. Um, and it's the case then that you don't at this moment in time have a, a system specification or a business case? We do not at the moment, no. We are not at the stage where we are spending money on the, the detailed design of IT systems. Um, there will be for some of the benefits, though, um, that are about to be procured. Um, the, the Wave 1 benefits we're obviously pushing towards um, creating a system to enable enable us to administer those benefits. Um, there, 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 there will be a business case for, for that. So I don't understand how you're able to arrive at a figure if you've not got a system specification or a business case because they will provide the component parts of any system and obviously the, the detailed costs so, or even the high level costs would drive from that. You, you are correct. The, 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 the detailed costs that we actually spend on IT will be driven by a detailed system specification and a business case. However, um, we wanted to give the, the committee an indication of, of, of likely costs. So, uh, as I said, we have made a number of assumptions around building the system in-house, have costed those out. Um, using a, a, a broad design for a, for a potential system, um, have, have wrapped costs around the, the potential components of those systems and have, have applied uh, optimism, bias and contingency as appropriate in, in order to come to this £190 million cost. Um, it is, it is the, 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 the line of your questioning is why the, the financial memorandum is so heavily caveated in, in regard to the implementation costs. There, there will continue to be uncertainty as the, as the programme moves along and becomes more defined and defines precisely what we're going to, to build or buy. It may be helpful, convener, if, if, we're, if the panel are able to write to us, just providing more detail as to how a £190 million figure has arrived at, you know, because I, I think there's an awful lot of assumptions being made there. OK, good. Willie, you got the same idea? Aye, thanks very much, convener. I mean, clearly it's a, it's a substantial set-aside figure for the IT procurement, but it does look as though it's over half of the total implementation cost, the entire... Program. I'm just keen to find out. Um, can you just remind me when this must, when the system must go live, <laughs> and where are we now? And it, were it pre, pre pre specification? I think from what you're saying. Um, definitely. When when does it need to be live? Um, different elements of the system will need to be live at different times. Um, I, I think the, the Cabinet Secretary for, for Communities, Social Security and Equality has announced the, the Wave 1 benefits. Uh, I, I, that's CARES allowance supplement by summer 18, um, funeral expense assistance and Best Start grant by summer 2019. Um, so, so they will require to be systems to administer those benefits within those timescales. Um, further benefits, are, are the timescales are yet to be announced, but there, there will be elements of IT, I would imagine, required to support those ele uh, elements as they are announced. So when, when are we going to start the process of specking the requirements so that the system's ready on time for the first benefit that needs to be live at the 
earliest. I might invite Kevin to, to uh, describe our, our programme's agile methodology, which I think might assist with that. Yes, um, the Low Income Benefit Project uh, is, is undertaking um, a discovery exercise to, to scope out what the requirements um, might be um, for that. Um, and I think it's important to say that <clears throat> fundamentally, the fundamental approach, fundamental approach is that a, a phased approach is being taken to the development of the different parts of the system in order to de-risk the, the programme more generally. So it's not a big bang uh, approach, as it were. Um, looking at the phasing of the, wa the Wave 1 benefits, um, the individual components that are required are being you know, will be developed um, in due course. They're you know, ga gathering the, the, the requirements in, in a discovery phase. Um, d d does, that, does that help? Uh, sort of, but it doesn't really answer. What, 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 you know, when is the process going to begin to spec what we need so that it's ready for summer 18? I mean, this is October. Yeah, the work is ongoing at the moment in the discovery phase. But specking the requirements, as Mr Kelly was referring to, is that actually underway at the moment? Because one of the fundamentals of any sofa development is specifying the requirements, understanding what they are, and delivering that, sticking to it and delivering it. Just again, if it would be helpful, the first Scottish benefits to be paid is the carer's allowance supplement, which will be paid in the form of two um, roughly six monthly payments annually in order to, between the two of them, account for a year's worth of the carer's allowance supplement. And that benefit has been designed the way it has been designed. My understanding is in order, so that it can actually be delivered through um, Scottish Government's existing SEAS payment system. So the, the system design, service design um, requirements for the first benefit are very uh, kind of quite deliberately intended to require less um, in terms of new build, in terms of new systems and so on. The, as, as Kevin has said, the um, service and system design for Wave 1, which is 2019, um, is currently ongoing at the moment. They're going into discovery phase. They'll go from discovery through the alpha build, the beta build, and so on and so forth. So if the question pertains to the first payments, the carers allowance supplement payment, and the, the system requirements for um, work for that, um, that has been, benefit has been designed in order to make it as manageable as possible within the envelope that we can currently deliver with our own systems without needing new build for that part of it. Okay, in terms of the, the overall numbers of transactions, the, the financial memorandum says here quite clearly that the number of transactions the Scottish Government will carry out in a week with the new system is more than what we currently do in a year. Now, that's a huge volume of transactions that we're anticipating with the system. Are you confident that we'll be able to, the systems will be able to cope with the volume that's going to come through this system to be processed? If I'm right in thinking about what you just said, that won't, most of that won't happen until 2019. But on, you, on you go. Uh, per perhaps beyond 2019, um, the, 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 as, as I think Chris said, the, the initial Wave 1 benefits are, are on the smaller side in terms of the, the greater whole of the, the number of transactions that are actually being devolved. Um, I think there is work ongoing now um, looking at a payment platform to ensure that we have a, a, a robust uh, system to make payments to the people of Scotland. Um, I think it is viewed um, by, by the programme um, as being a, an absolute critical factor factor in our work, we, we, we must ensure that payments go when, when, uh, when we say they're going to go. There, can, there cannot be failure there. Um, so uh, the, the work has started now. We are, we are looking at a number of options um, for systems, um, and that, that work will develop over time. Um, to ensure that we, we have a system in place when we need it. Um, the likes of the, the carers allowance supplement, we are using existing systems. We would, we would plan to pay, pay that through the, the Scottish Executive Accounting System payment platform because we know it is a robust and re reliable system um, to ensure that we are, we are at no risk of, of, uh, of not meeting our payment dates. Okay. Thank you. We're going to another area, which I'm going to bring in uh, Neil Bibby on in terms of causal costs. I think the point that James Kelly raised and followed up by Willie Coffey, I think, right. I think it would be best if the government were to write to us, laying out over the period of time that's that this this whole programme will roll, roll, roll out, what you know about the procurement process um, and, and the various stages that will be required between now and the final benefit becoming 
the responsibility of the Scottish Government. I think that would be helpful. Um, I, I recognise that that's technically not what this bill is about. This is an enabling bill, and that and that goes beyond what the the support for this particular bill is concerned. But I think the legitimate questions have still been asked. So, Neil. In terms of uh, COSLA, COSLA have told us on the figure of £21 million for local delivery um, that they believe it's unclear what assumptions have been made and what might be in or out for local delivery given the levels of uncertainty that still exist. More detailed scoping of local delivery services and costings will be needed to understand what is actually required to deliver the principles outlined in the bill. I can ask what, what has been done or what will be done to address the concerns of local councils going forward? Yes, I think that's probably a... Um, we are currently engaged in a programme of engagement activity with all of Scotland's local authorities. I think we are up to the point when, where um, local delivery colleagues will have visited 16 out of the 32, and the intention is to continue that engagement until we have um, met with and discussed these with, um, with all 32. Um, of our local authorities. The points that we have made so far are firstly that the agency's local presence will be agency staff, there will not be local government staff. We're not talking about rebadging existing local government staff resource, we are talking about adding a new agency resource um, into local government areas. We've been talking about local government areas partly because it is a reasonably easy way of describing the, the uh, locality part of it. Um, I think we have been reasonably clear that we're not necessarily talking about using local gov uh, government premises or sites, facilities in all instances. The wording that the Minister has used is that we intend to base our local presence in places where people currently visit. It may be local government premises, it may also be um, NHS Scotland, health or social care premises. The decisions on, on these matters will be taken on an area by area basis, dependent on essentially what, the, uh, what we believe will work for that specific local area. This, to an extent, is where it becomes useful to talk about local authorities because it's a good way of breaking the country up and it's a good way of um, describing what you mean when you're talking about a specific local area. But we're not, I don't think, necessarily talking about um, using local, uh, local government facilities in, in all instances, in every instance. Where we do, there will be recharging. Um, Scottish Government will meet any costs on the local authority that are incurred as a result of us occupying or using the, their premises. But until we have a local authority, local area by area breakdown and a, and a model for each area is precisely what we will be putting where. It's perhaps not possible to, to um, interrogate that, uh, that impact on each LA in detail. Okay. Okay. I don't think I have a follow up. Okay. Um, uh, Patrick, I think you stole one area you wanted to talk about and that was about potential value of mm. savings elsewhere on budgets and how that's going to be accounted for. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and again, this uh, this memorandum um, doesn't only address the uh, immediate uh, impacts of the the bill itself, uh, but it does touch on the longer term operation of the the newly devolved powers. Um, and yet, it seems to me that for the most part, it's still cast in terms purely of additional costs that come from paying benefits. Uh, and I'm wondering how and to what extent the Scottish Government intends to uh, estimate the additional value to the public purse uh, of paying benefits through reducing the demand on other public services, whether the, the healthcare system or, or, or anything else, uh, just to give, uh, not, not just financial costs, but to place a value on, on other uh, benefits as well. One example would be the, the proposal that we put forward and that the Government seems to be open to on a, a young carer's allowance. Uh, specific uh, to, to young carers, if that's delivered well and achieves its objectives, it should uh, enable young people uh, who are also carers to get greater value from their education, remove some of the barriers that they currently face to, to that publicly funded education service actually achieving what it's what it's being 
what the money's being spent for. So how and to what extent are those other benefits going to be uh, assessed uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the impact on public finances or the effectiveness of spending public money uh, through uh, more than just the, the extra financial cost of paying benefits? Um, I'll perhaps start and then bring Kevin in if that's okay. Um, I, I think it's a good point you raise. Um, I, I think when we prepared, uh, or when our colleagues prepared the outline business case for the for the agency in Scotland, it was an issue we began to look at. Um, the, the, the OBC goes into detail on uh, the marginal utility gained as a result of social security expenditure, that for every pound we spend in the, in the lower income deciles, there is a greater a, a greater marginal utility gained from mm. by those individuals. Um, as a, and it, it, it details that and attempts to quantify that benefit in a weighted way to, to show the, the, the benefit of, of social security expenditure in Scotland. Um, re related to that, I think, uh, in more detail and more specifically, um, are the points that you raise around how do we how do we quantify the impacts on the on the other areas of, of, of the public sector? Um, the, there is an element in the fiscal framework where we try to do that, um, or where, where we describe how we will do that. Um, that there is a the the and uh, and the in the fiscal framework covers the interaction between the UK uh, public sector um, and the Scottish public sector. Mm. Um, it accounts for spillovers where we have a, a, a policy, where we make a uh, make a policy decision that has an impact down uh, down in, in the rest of the UK. How uh, marginal savings that might be gained might be transferred between the organise uh, between the governments. Um, that that uh, I'll perhaps bring Kevin in there to give you. Yeah, just to add to that, um, the outline business case. Um, used a multi-criteria analysis framework to um, weigh up the relative merits of the different options for the design of the agency. So factors like dignity and respect, implementability and risk, and other other factors um, like that were were used in that in that scoring process. Um, so, so I, I would imagine that that moving forwards, um, when ongoing decisions are made on the programme, that kind of that framework is, 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 is used. And when we then transition into measuring what we call measurable improvements that the programme is delivering, mm. um, we, we, have, we will have a measurable improvement strategy that will basically ensure that the programme, the money spent on the programme, is, is aligned with the measurable improvements that it's being delivered, so we can as, we can assess the value for money of the the programme, and I think it's, it is important, as 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 you say, to to bring in the the wider societal impacts, so that we're not just setting up a payments platform to 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 pay money to people. We're setting up an agency that will treat dignity, treat people with dignity and respect, and I think, you know, finding wider measures. To, 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 to demonstrate the, the measurable improvements and the benefits that the agency is delivering will, will be important. And that's, so that's an ongoing piece of work or area of thinking? Yes, the measurable improvements uh, manager on, on the programme is, there, there's a role in the programme whose job it is to, to bring this, this kind of thing together. Um, it feeds into the business cases, it feeds into the socio-economic socio case of the programme business case, um, and it is by so by by including financial and non-financial <coughs> measures, uh, we can establish the the wider value for money of a particular project or initiative. Okay, thank you. I think I've captured everybody who wanted to contribute in this and ask questions. So can I thank very much the government bill team for coming along today. We'll now obviously reflect on the evidence you provided to us, and we'll be writing to, in due course to the lead committee to let them know. Um, some of the, the outcomes of our of this discussion. So I'm very grateful for you coming along. I now suspend this meeting. Um, no, I don't. I, I, I close it because we're now moving into the public part because we're now moving into private. Thank you very much.